rabies is the topic and rabies is a rather a, a tragic viral encephalitis that can occur in anyone's that uh, becomes bitten by an infected animal um, the animal transmits the virus through its saliva to the human being and the saliva then enters the a body from the site of entry and then via the peripheral nerves it actually travels to the spinal cord and brain and then eventually can be universally fatal if not treated properly and the animals that are involved usually are animals that are out in the wild such as bats raccoons skunks foxes coyotes animals like that and domestic animals are definitely uh, uh, involved in cases of rabies such as dogs uh, but in countries such as Canada or the United States these animals that are domesticated are used as pets are uh, vaccinated so they tend to not have the active rabies uh, infection so if someone is been bitten by an animal that has rabies what what happens well the first thing is that there will be pain at the site of the bite and then over time you'll have a lot of non-specific uh, symptoms such as fever headache but then after some time you'll get the classic signs of rabies which is encephalitis because it's affecting the brain and spinal cord and there's a lot of uh, central nervous system symptoms such as confusion uh, hallucinations uh, bizarre behavior essentially and then you also can get uh, this hydrophobia which by definition is fear of water um, because what happens is the patient is unable to drink because of the painful spasms that occur in their laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles and then eventually this can also lead to a uh, paralysis so pretty pretty uh, devastating symptoms and then it can lead to death if not treated uh, with post-exposure prophylaxis and I'll talk a little bit about that later a diagnosis in the patient uh, usually it's done with a skin biopsy what you do is you take a biopsy of the skin from the back of the neck and uh, this is a uh, tested and the animal is also tested and I'll talk a little bit more about this treatment well the treatment unless treated death occurs usually within three to ten days of the bite so there's a very uh, specific uh, prevention protocol established and I'll talk about that prevention slash treatment the first part of this is something called pre-exposure and pre-exposure basically means how do you deal with people who are at high risk so these people have not been bitten yet this is just people that are at high risk so veterinarians uh, animal handlers people who work in caves anyone who's at high risk travelers to endemic areas and they're basically given a rabies vaccine and that is essentially how you uh, deal with people who are at high risk pre-exposure then you have post-exposure post-exposure means someone who's been bitten so a bite has occurred now interestingly the guidelines recommend that the bite is to be cleaned and the area needs to be thoroughly cleaned with soap and water and that will lead to um, the proper post-exposure uh, treatment 
Now we come to the most important part, which is called post-exposure prophylaxis. And this is the part that you probably will be tested on, most likely. And we'll abbreviate this PAP. Now, post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP, consists of giving a vaccine, a rabies vaccine, and also giving with it a rabies immunoglobulin. Also abbreviated RIG, rabies immunoglobulin. So PEP basically means vaccine plus the RIG together. Now when do you give this? Now I'm going to try to explain this as best as possible because there's four scenarios so the question is, how do you decide? So we'll go through each of those four scenarios. How do you decide when to give the post-exposure prophylaxis, which consists of the vaccine and the immunoglobulin? OK, the first scenario is when there's a domestic animal that's involved. And this is usually you know, a pet. And there's no signs. The animal is non-symptomatic, has no signs of rabies and there's been a bite. So we're, we're all talking of course all, all about bites here. What you do is you observe the animal for 10 days and then if everything's okay you don't have to do anything. If the animal is observed for 10 days and there is signs of rabies then if there's positive signs of rabies, then you give the post-exposure prophylaxis, which consists of the vaccine plus the immunoglobulin. Rabies vaccine plus the rabies immunoglobulin. Okay, so that takes care of the first scenario. Second scenario is, again, a domestic animal. So somebody's pet. But the animal is symptomatic. The animal does show signs of rabies what you do is you have a veterinarian check the animal to see if the animal indeed has signs of rabies and then what you do if the answer is definitely yes by the veterinarian then you have to give post exposure prophylaxis to the patient unfortunately if the animal does have signs of rabies most animals with rabies usually die within 10 days so that's the unfortunate fate of the animal. Now we get to numbers three and four. Now number three is a wild animal. So you're out in the wild and some animal bit you. What do you do? Well, if that's the case, then the animal needs to be captured. And unfortunately for the animal, it needs to be killed, euthanized, and tested. And tested for rabies. The brain needs to be tested. Now, if the brain is tested for rabies and it's positive for rabies, then you give post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, you might say, why don't you just give the prof post-exposure prophylaxis without having to kill the animal? Well, because uh, post-exposure pro prophylaxis is very painful, and it also carries its own risks involved, like any you know, treatment. So this is the standard protocol. And the final is if the animal is not available you were bitten and then you know you came to a hospital then you have to just go ahead and give the post exposure prophylaxis there's nothing you can do animals not available animals not available for observation and the animal is not available for testing so that is the standard protocol and now let's look at some vignettes 20-year-old man comes to your office with a dog bite to his left thigh received after he and a friend taunted a neighbor's dog. He reports that the bite occurred about 36 hours ago and came to your office after co-workers informed him that the dog bites frequently become infected. Dog bites frequently become infected. His temperature is 98, blood pressure is 110, pulse is 63, respirations are 13. On exam, you notice a shallow abrasion on his left thigh, which is mildly tender. There is no surrounding e edema or erythema. 
most appropriate man management of this patient is to. Well, remember, this is a neighbor's dog, so it's a pet. So you don't need to jump to the post-exposure prophylaxis with vaccines and immunoglobulins right yet. And the animal was uh, taunted, it was provoked. So chances are the animal's perfectly fine. It has no symptoms of uh, rabies. So you don't need to give any vaccine at this point. So A is out. Now you, you talk about antibiotics here, but they say there's no edema or erythema. So at this point, the only thing you need to do is the post-exposure. Not post-exposure prophylaxis, but just the post-exposure treatment, which involves thoroughly cleaning the wound with soap and water, and that would be choice E. No antibiotics are necessary at this time. Next question. A six-year-old girl is brought to the emergency department by her parents immediately after she was bitten on the hand by the neighbor's domestic dog. Father reports that the girl tried to pet the dog while it was eating. The dog has been vaccinated regularly. Examination shows three bite marks on the dorsum of the left hand with broken skin and dried blood. The wound is cleaned and bandaged, which of the following is the most appropriate next step for rabies prophylaxis. Okay, so this is a scenario uh, that involves, again, a domestic dog. And this dog basically has been vaccinated and does not show any signs. So it's an asymptomatic domestic pet. So if that's the case, you certainly don't need to give any sort of post-exposure prophylaxis immediately. So you don't need to give immunoglobulin, no need to give the vaccine, and you don't need to give them together. So you're left with choice D or E. Now, the patient's uh, been bitten by an asymptomatic domestic pet. So in that scenario, you basically just need to observe the animal for 10 days to see if it develops any signs of rabies. During those 10 days, if the animal does, then you give the post-exposure prophylaxis. So that would be, in terms of choices, choice E. Choice D is not the correct answer because that's reserved for wild animals or um, uh, a domestic animal that shows signs of rabies. But that is not the scenario in this clinical vignette. And then last one. During a hunting trip, a young man is bitten by a coyote. The animal is captured and brought to the authorities alive, which of the following is the most important criterion to determine the patient's need for rabies prophylaxis. Well, you've got a wild animal, and it is available. So the t standard protocol is unfortunately the animal needs to be killed, euthanized, and the brain needs to be tested for rabies. If the brain is tested for rabies and is positive for rabies, then you give post-exposure prophylaxis. Now again, you might say, well, why don't you just give the post-exposure prophylaxis without killing the animal? And the reason is because post-exposure prophylaxis is very painful and risky, so if it's not necessary to give, you don't need to give it, you shouldn't give it. So of these answer choices, that would be choice D, killing the animal and examining the brain. Choice E, which says the events that took place have already established the need to proceed with rabies immunization is not true. Because just because the animal's in the wild doesn't necessarily mean that the animal has rabies. You still need to kill the animal and test the animal's brain. And then observing this one, this is uh, only uh, true for domestic pets. For domestic uh, uh, pets, this is the part of the standard protocol.